Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching. My name is um, Florian Engert. I'm a professor at Harvard for neuroscience, interested in circuits, brain circuits, and um, how they generate behavior. And this is the second of three talks I'm giving for the iBio seminar series. So if you haven't watched the first part, I strongly encourage you to do so because um, it will help you a lot with um, understanding this um, second lecture. Second lecture is going to be about um, game control. The first one was generally about neuroscience in larval zebrafish. In this one, I will um, explore in more detail how we can use the power that the larval zebrafish as a model system gives us to actually investigate um, deeper and more fundamental questions in the neurosciences. So uh, this all gets back to uh, something that probably everybody who's watching um, really wants to know, and that is how does the brain work. Um, that's really what drives um, all of us. It's I, also, I think, one of the most fundamental unsolved questions um, in modern sciences. And there is a conception that is widespread that I want to challenge. And this concept, conception is that what the brain is doing, it receives sensory input and then generates motor output. So it processes the information that's coming in, um, does some computations, performs computations on it, and then it just generates the appropriate motor output. And the whole talk today is about um, how this is probably really a wrong way of thinking about things. The real better way of thinking about it is um, what the brain is doing. It is generating constantly um, spontaneous ongoing activity. What you probably th think about um, is thinking. Right? You, um, and we don't need sensory input to have um, an active brain, and neither do most animals. So a lot of stuff is going on in the brain when there's no, in the absence of any sensory input. And this ongoing activity, you can even think about free will in that context, um, will also generate um, motor output. And um, what I'll talk about today is uh, a different form um, of sensory input, um, which is called um, reafference. And this is the sensory input that is not generated by something that happens in the outside world. But this is changes that hit your sensory organs, like your eyes, your ears, um, um, your skin, um, as a consequence of your own action. Right? Your own action that is actually generated by ongoing activity. So the animal can spontaneously initiate an action, and this action, this activity, in itself can generate um, sensory input where the cause is not the outside world, something happening in the outside world, but where the cause is um, um, your own um, motor action. Reafference is the word, as opposed to exafference. Exafference would be um, input that is caused by external agents in the world. Right? And if you think a little bit about this, it becomes clear that those two are fundamentally different forms of information. Exafference tells you something about what's going on in the world, which you need to know to survive. Reafference tells you what you just did. So this is information that you already have, that your brain already have, because it generated this action in the first place. So this shouldn't come as a surprise. Reafferent should be something that is fully expected by the brain. And only if there's a mismatch between this expectation and what you actually, what's actually coming back, that's what the brain should act upon. And this is, in a way, the whole context, um, context of today's talk. Um, so there are two copies of information available to your brain about an action you just it, it just performed. One is called the um, efference copy. This is simply a copy of the motor corollary that generated muscle movement and action in the first place. And another one would be this um, reafference, um, is a consequence of the, uh, the action that comes back through the sensory organs. And usually um, what brains do, I think in all animals, is compare the two and sort of subtract them. Yes, either subtract them or um, that would be um, one um, um, algorithm, the other one is simply suppression. Yeah. So whenever there's an efference copy, like I'm moving my eyes, then um, the sensory input, the 
information coming through the eyes can simply be suppressed because the brain knows this is irrelevant. Yes, I know already I'm moving my eyes. I don't need additional. I could suppress. I could silence it. Um, I'll briefly show an example about this um, um, in a minute. The other one would be subtraction, that I have an expected motion that should come back. And if I subtract this, then I leave the sensory organ free to um, um, watch out for exafferents. Um, so suppression, in a way, is an easy algorithm. It just means silencing. It means blinding yourself when you move your eyes or when you move forward. Subtraction is a harder algorithm. Um, it just means you have to be more precise and you have to recalibrate all the time. And in a way, this is the mechanism we'll discuss in much more detail later um, in my talk. Um, I want to, to make this clearer. I want to walk you through several forms of this um, ex-afferent, re-afferent um, difference or in, in a way this um, um, reafferent modulation. And the first one is, um, the first modality I want to discuss this in is in the visual system. And for that I would like the audience, all of you out there, to uh, participate. Um, first, just um, watch and move your eyes yes, around through the screen or um, and through, through the room that you're sitting in. And you will realize that when you move your eyes, um, of course the image projected on your retinas will move. But it does, there's no apparent motion, right? The, something in your brain um, cancels out this motion that's clearly there as a consequence of eye motion, and you don't perceive it. On the other hand, and this is something that um, Helmholtz already um, discovered, I want all of you to close one eye. You can use your hand to close it, or you can, if it's easier, and then push against the open, gently, against your open eye with your finger. And what you'll see, what all of you will see, that suddenly the world jerks, moves, right? And that is interesting because if I do that, I see motion. And I'm, I'm moving my eyeball now with my finger muscles, and I see it. If I'm moving my eyeball with my eye muscles, I don't see motion. Yeah. So this tells me already, and Helmholtz already um, realized that, that um, there is a difference. So if I move my eye, it would be a reafferent motion signal if something in the world moves. Or oh, this is in a way ex-afferent. A funny form of ex-afferent because now the motion is generated by my finger muscle and clearly the brain is not ready for that because usually we never move our eyes by um, um, jerking them ar around with fingers. So this is a, a sort of very intuitive um, example of the, the two differences and it tells you that even in daily life that all of you experience this all the time. A second example for a different modality is um, voice. So I can either hear somebody speaking, that would be ex-afferent, Reafferent is hearing my own voice. And how we know that this gets processed differently, just listen to your own voice on tape. It sounds really weird. So, and why it sounds so weird is because your brain, now when I'm speaking, yes, my brain automatically subtracts um, the expected um, auditory signals. So that's why I don't really hear myself speaking with a German accent and I don't hear that I have a slight lisp and this all sounds perfectly natural because my brain sort of subtracts, uh, subtracts and cancels this already out. If I later watch my, my, my video here um, on tape I'll be slightly embarrassed but um, I think all of you will share um, the same sentiment. Another interesting modality to um, analyze the difference between reafferents and exafferents is getting touched. So all of you um, probably have made the experience that it is entirely different um, if you um, get touched by somebody else or if you're touching yourself. Now I know what all of you are thinking now and um, um, what I mean of course is tickling. Yes, um, so tickling yourself doesn't really work and getting tickled um, as illustrated by this cartoon um, is an entirely different story. And the reason again is the difference between reafferents and exafferents. If you tickle yourself it's a reafferent stimulus your brain is expecting the sensation already and it's cancelling it out. So that's tickling only works if it's not expected, if it comes as a surprise. And this is true for obviously for all kinds of um, ways of, um, of getting touched. The um, final part, and I want to leave that to um, the audience to contemplate, to ruminate about this, is about olfactory reafferents, right? Um, um, but I'm not going to go into detail. I'll um, leave that to your um, creativity, imagination, and fantasy. And the difference, think about it, difference um, in ex-afferent and re-afferent olfactory stimulation. 
I want to go now to um, how to study this best in animals. And for that, um, um, the tethered preparations for the, that I've introduced already in the first um, video will make an um, appearance again. This is shown here on the left. It's a tethered fly that can fly. You can monitor the wing beats. You can use that to extract the intended motion. On the right, it's a rat running on a running on a, on a, on a track ball. Both animals are fixed and tethered. On the left, this is a setup that was really optimized and perfected by Michael Dickinson, now at Caltech again. And um, on the right, I think the mouse on a track ball was really pioneered by David Tank um, at Princeton. Um, so this is something you can do now to um, have an animal behave, but you can control the sensory stimulus it um, receives um, completely independent of the animal's action. So this allows you to do two things. You can either do open loop, yes, where it's only ex-afferent, or you can make it perfectly re-afferent, because you know exactly what the animal is doing. You can calculate online what the expected sensory feedback is, and you can deliver that to the animal such that it now um, can operate as if it's interacting in a, in a, normal, um, in a normal world. Uh, this technology is not modern, no matter what people tell you, what they think. Um, it is actually um, very, very old, and it was pioneered um, 60, 70, um, almost 70 years ago by two of my, my heroes, um, Bernhard Hassenstein and, and, and Werner Reichert, um, who did um, experiments in the 1950s on um, questions like that, um, reafference, exafference, and how um, these respective signals are processed by the brain, in this case in, in insects. And the insect they used was the Rüsselkiefer, Chlorophanus viridis, it's a beetle, which is not so popular as a model system anymore, maybe because it is not um, a, a genetically viable model system, but I think it's very, very pretty. And what they used the, um, as, a, as a tethered preparation for the Rüsselkiefer was the Spangenglobus. Um, so the Spangenglobus is a, a contraption that is very lightweight, lightweight, either here made out of aluminum or here made out of bamboo. And it's um, so light that the beetle can pick it up effortlessly. So you glue the beetle to a stick and then lower it onto the Spangenglobus, wait till it latches on, you lift the whole thing up and then the beetle will start walking on this globe. It will come to these choice points, it either has to go left or right, and it will just um, keep walking. Um, so it's tethered. And you can make it um, 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 closed loop or open loop by putting it inside of a cookie drum here um, with patterns um, that you can rotate um, while observing the beetle. So you can now give the beetle, this tethered beetle, beetle feedback um, um, that can be appropriate or inappropriate for its um, um, locomotion. Um, so all of this um, technology, I think, was already in place. Um, and it's maybe a, some suggestion for all of you there. If you think you have a new idea, yes, something novel that nobody has thought um, of before, um, you're probably wrong. You should search the old literature and you'll discover that most of these good ideas have been um, had already. What they used, Hassenstein and Reichert, to um, decipher, uh, uh, to, 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 um, um, what they used this technology for was to um, dissect how neural circuits can um, process motion, and in particular, how um, a neural circuit can distinguish between leftward or rightward motion, which turns out to be a relatively hard problem. And they proposed as a solution the um, eponymous hassenstein reichert detector, which is still um, the gold standard for um, modern circuits um, of motion detection. There's ongoing papers being published every month on, um, on this structure, and it was discovered by Hassenstein and Reichert with the Rüsselkäfer on the Spangenglobus. So this is just sort of a, um, um, a lesson, a sort of a bit of a historic lesson. Another example um, where a modern version of that, I said this already in Michael Dickinson's lab, um, the fly flight simulator, you can do a tethered um, Drosophila in, 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 in flight. And here is um, um, sort of one of the older um, applications is where an ex-afferent version where the fly is receiving a motion stimulus, but it's independent of the, um, the uh, um, motion of the fly itself, the flying motion. Yes, sir. And you wonder, what is the fly thinking, right? When it's flying, it's turning left, it's turning right, but the stimulus it receives is completely independent of its own motion. 
And um, that's why these um, um, experiments should be taken with a grain of salt, because that is not a natural condition. Usually the motion that a fly, a flying fly receives, depends heavily on its own motion. And it will expect, the fly will expect, that whenever it's moving, that the world will move accordingly. And if it doesn't, it receives an error signal. So this is sort of the short for error, something went wrong here. And in, in a way, a, an animal in that condition will constantly receive an error. A, 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 an error signal very similar to what happens in your computers with, um, if something goes wrong. What you can do if the error signal is consistent, consistently wrong, as done here by an old study by Martin Heisenberg um, in Würzburg, is if you, in this case, if whenever the fly turns right, usually the stimulus moves left. In this case, what they did, whenever the fly turns right, the stimulus moved also to the right. So there was a consistent reafferent signal, it was just wrong, it had the wrong sign. And what this slide um, illustrates is that um, the fly can originally, in a normal setting, a normal reafferent setting, flies will home in on this black bar. They will always try to keep this bar centered, which you can do in a closed loop um, um, environment. And here is the, um, the, um, the data over time. On the right hand side is shown what happens if you reverse the sign of this closed loop setting. Um, and, and you'll see that the fly, over the course of maybe 20 or 30 minutes, learns to adapt. So it can change its internal gain. It knows now that the world is operating to different rules, and it will change its behavior accordingly. It can still center here the, the stripe, in spite of the fact that it's going the opposite direction. This is the same if, if, as if we would put inverting goggles on all of you um, in the audience. Initially, you would be very unhappy, because the world would constantly behave in the opposite way that you expect. But over the course of a few hours, you can probably adapt and, um, and, and learn how to deal with that. Um, finally, what I would like to talk about is the larval zebrafish. How do we do this in the larval zebrafish? And for that, we have to tether the larval zebrafish and put it into a virtual environment. And um, again, the details of that will be in the first lecture, my first talk in, in the context of this um, Three lecture series. Um, here you have um, a larval zebrafish that's behaving really, it's wiggling its tail. Um, and um, what we can do, we can um, replace, well, we can paralyze the animal completely with bangorotoxin, a muscle paralyticum. The neurons still work fine. Um, and then we can record the um, neurons going into the spinal cord, innervating um, the muscles with um, suction pipettes through the skin. This is not invasive. Um, the fish is suspended in midwater, um, like in an isolation tank, and we can extract the behavior now, the fictive, the fictive swims through these um, two um, electrodes, one on the left, one on the right. And as you can see here and here, the real swim and the fictive swim um, are um, very, very similar, and this really allows us to decode the fish behavior in spite of the fact that it's not behaving at all. And here I'll show this movie again now, um, and that featured already in the first part, where you'll see now a um, larval zebrafish navigating fictively, without moving anything, a virtual environment, just random doodles on, on the dot, dot here. On the right you see the world from the fish's perspective. Um, the screen is being moved underneath him, and you see he's swimming around, He's navigating fictively, and um, the, uh, occasionally he crosses over the dark gap into the brighter regions. They are phototactic. They like the, the bright regions better than the dark. So this fish is swimming around now um, um, in one of these red islands. And um, you'll see he's going he's gonna to cross over soon over the abyss into another red island. And um, this shows the trajectory of this animal over 15 minutes. And this just tells us that they um, do this just fine. So this, is, this, this works. Um, one thing that you've noticed is every time the fish executes a fictive swim, we move the screen by a certain amount. This was initially calibrated by how much we move the screen. Depends really on the experimenter. This depended on Misha Arendt, um, 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 who programmed the whole setup. So uh, you can either move the screen a lot. This um, gives the fish an illusion of superpower. A little swim will propel him a large distance, or we can move it very little. This is the reafferent signal that we are manipulating here. The fish can either be very strong, it gets a lot of feedback for each motor action, or we can, so we can dial this up and down. We can turn him into a super fish, or we can turn him into a, a really lame-o fish. 
effectively. The story I'm um, going to finish off with um, 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 illustrates how we did that and how we made first inroads on deciphering the neural correlates underlying this um, gain control. I hope that the issue of gain has become a little bit clearer now. What we mean by gain is um, how much reafferent signal do I get for a given motor action. High gain would mean that um, for a given um, motor action, I get a lot of visual flow. I move fast. If I move very sluggishly, then I would have would be in a low gain setting. Yeah. This is a little bit like um, Keanu Reeves in the Matrix, and most of you I think have seen the movie, right? How he can gain superpowers, right? And that's all in the computer software, in the movie as well as in our fish. The story um, was published in Nature. It did not get that, that cover. I think that's why we are allowed to show it here. Um, this is a cover that Misha made, and I think they should have picked it. Um, um, it's an awesome depiction of a larval zebra fish in the matrix. Um, um, what they picked instead was some lame whale, I think. Uh, but I'm sharing it here with you, so um, it gets some exposure. Gain control, yes, we'll need a different um, version, a different cartoon version, a different movie star, and I'll tell you later which movie star we picked. So this is an experiment where we actually did this in a larval superfish. And what you can see here is in the top row, the um, swim vigor of the fish, the two channels, the fictive swim channels, left um, and right. And in the bottom, you see how fast the world actually moves for a given swim of the fish. Again, this is something that the experimenter can adjust. So for high gain means little swims lead, in a, lead to a lot of... Um, power, fish power, forward motion, whereas low gain um, um, means that the resulting feedback, the motion that the fish receives for a given swim is low. Initially, you can see here that the fish is just um, swimming along happily in his high gain setting. And that's where we played a dirty trick on the fish, is we suddenly reduced um, its power to generate um, forward motion. And um, what you'll see initially, he swims now very slowly. The motion is very, very, very slow, but the fish, within a few bouts, within a few seconds, um, ramps up now his um, swim vigor to um, compensate for this sudden um, loss in, um, in swim power. And this tells us something really interesting. This tells us that the fish actually is not a simple sensory motor reflex machine. It actually cares about the consequences of its actions. So um, it monitors the reafference, and if there's a mismatch, if there's an error between what it expects and what is really happening, it readjusts its behavior to compensate for that. This is gain control. This is also motor learning. This is probably the fundamental algorithm that all of you are using when you're learning a new motor skill, like serving in tennis, like golf, like... Um, knitting, I don't know what floats your boat, but every time you learn a new motor skill, the one thing you need to do is adjust the specific gains for each action. What you'll see here, if we switch back to high gain, the fish initially, not surprisingly, overshoots, so he doesn't in instantly know how to use his new gain superpower, um, um, but very quickly um, he learns how to apply um, um, his new strength. Um, here's sort of a a more um, quantitative analysis of, uh, of this. This is the first swim after a gain change, either to high or to low gain. And we can see that the number of bursts, this is the, sort of the number of fictive tail beats per swim, um, is the same for high and low gain. But um, for the second swim after the gain change, and the third, the fourth, and uh, the sixth, and the twelfth, you'll see that um, if we switch to low gain, the um, number of tail beats um, increases, and if we switch to high gain, the number of tail beats um, decreases. Yes, this is the separation of those two bumps. And here's uh, just a, a, another quant quantification. If we go swim bout number here, and the relative um, number of um, nerve bursts or tail beats, um, you can see how in one case, how quickly the fish learns to do that, right? In one case, if we switch to lo low gain, he instantly goes up. And for, um, if you switch to high gain, he very quickly um, drops his uh, vigor. So they learn this very, very quickly. And this is a bona fide learning, a motor learning process. How long does this memory last is another question. It lasts up to 10 seconds. So if we don't give the fish any feedback, yes, 
um, and then we test him again um, with one um, probe, we can see that um, either in high or in low gain, um, they, they, they remember what the last setting was, at least up to um, 10 seconds um, um, for, for a 10 second interval. So I think the appropriate action figure is not the matrix in this case, it is the Hulk, for several reasons. One, we have shown that the fish can learn how to control appropriately newfound superpowers. And um, it's also green. And our fish um, also turn out to be green because we fill them with um, GFP. So I think this is really the um, appropriate um, um, comparison. Um, the G-CAMP, in this case not GFP, allows us to um, record um, neural activity throughout the brain while fish are undergoing these switches to positive or negative gain. And here the question that we wanted to ask is simply, what are the neural correlates? And can we come up with a model? Yes. It must include um, reafference, corollary discharges, so efference copies, comparisons, error signals, and then adjustment of the sensory motor transformation. So the whole brain imaging, those of you who've seen the first part, is something we can do routinely. And here now we can do this whole brain imaging in the context of this high gain, low gain switches. So this fish will um, swim for an hour and we constantly switch between low and between high gains. And what we can look at is for neurons that correlate with a high gain setting, with a low gain setting, and maybe more importantly, with neurons that code for the transition points. Because those are the putative error detection neurons that need to compare the expected values with the um, real values that are coming back. And to cut a longer story short and to spare you all the details, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we find. So first of all, if we go throughout the, through, um, through the whole brain, we can distinguish um, neurons that are responsible or correlate with locomotion, fast or, um, or, or little. And we can have um, complementary neurons that um, correlate with the sensory input that the fish receives. So here to the right, here is the head of the fish. That's the tail, this is a top-down view, and this is a side-on view. And, 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 and in pink and blue are all the neurons that we find that are um, correlated with the particular either locomotion or visual stimulus. And here is the interesting ones. Those are the gain up and gain down selective neurons. These are neurons that are only firing when there's an error signal, when there's a mismatch signal. Um, maybe one of the interesting regions that you might have heard of is the cerebellum. Um, um, a region in the brain in all vertebrates, including you guys, um, where we have um, exactly motor learning. And the uh, inferior olive down here is a small nu nucleus in all of your brains, in all mammalian vertebrate brains, that is responsible for error detection. Yes, uh, these are the error signals, the um, 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 neurons, the climbing fibers um, that send climbing fibers into the cerebellum and um, inform the cerebellum when something happened that was not expected needs correction. Yes. And maybe not surprisingly, but this lights up dramatically and we get different populations for gain up and for gain down, or gain, gain increase and, um, and gain decrease. So that tells us already that in a larval zebra fish um, um, these neurons exist and they have these respective um, properties. Um, um, so um, in a way we can propose a very simple model now um, how fish will do this, sort of a circuit model if you want. And um, what we need is we need a, a gain down or a gain up detector. These would be the putative neurons um, in the inferior olive that I just showed you. So one will detect when there's too little, another will detect when there's too much gain. And the way this is done, the circuit that we propose, is that ha we have in red a, um, an efference copy. This is the motor neurons that send the command down to the spinal cord. And the green neurons here would be um, whole field motion sensitive neurons that um, come from the retina and they detect simply backwards motion for the fish, which should correlate to forward motion of the animal. So whenever the fish moves forward, the world should move backwards, and those two signals should be matched. So what we can propose is that there is an inhibitory neuron from the eye and an excitatory neuron from the, um, um, from the spinal cord or from the hindbrain, and this gain down detector will only fire if the um, efference copy is stronger than the feedback. Yeah. This means that um, I'm swimming a lot 
Um, and the inhibition I get from the visual flow is not enough to cancel this. So now this neuron will fire whenever um, there is too little gain or too little feedback. And the, the other one is just a complementary one where we have inhibition from the efferent copy and excitation from the sensory. So this would be a gain up detector. And then we have an error signal here um, that fires. And the, um, well, so this would be sort of an, um, an illustration of that. Here is under normal conditions when there is no change in gain. Here is and suddenly if the gain goes down, we have a lot of swims, very little feedback. This neuron fires. Gain up means we swim very little, we get a lot of flow. This is the super fish here, yes. Um, and then this other neuron would fire, um, um, the, the, um, this blue neuron that just reported there has been an error of the positive kind. And then the effect of these neurons on the sensory motor transformation is simply that this needs to be a modulatory neuron that can strengthen the synapse. When the gain goes down, I have to swim harder. When the gain goes up, I have to swim weaker. Yes, sir. So that's sort of a, a model that we can now um, explore um, in future studies. And um, there has been already a, a cell paper by Misha Ahrens in his new lab at Janelia Farms, um, where he um, um, identified already the nature of these um, neurons and turned out to be serotonergic neurons in the dorsal raffae. For those of you who are interested, they, you can look this up. Um, I'm coming to the end um, of my story. Again, um, it was published um, a while ago. We did not get the cover. Yes, um, the cover was given to some lame whale. And um, here is the cover that we suggested. I think it's really cool. And again, I'm, I'm sharing it with you because I think it deserves um, um, some attention. It's the fish, the larval zebra fish in the matrix. And with that, I'll um, come to an end. I'll thank all of you for watching. Um, the, and most importantly, I thank the the people in my lab who did the work, um, I was mostly just um, standing on the sides and um, applauding. So thanks again.